and my arrow Straighter than narrow Wherever we go Everyone knows It's me and my arrow Thanks, Thanks for writing writing. Com. Our new home it's a brand new website. It's awesome. Check it out. New content being released all the time. All of our episodes will be on there. They will be released before they are available anywhere else. Give or take the fact that we're also getting ourselves out for the first time ever onto iTunes and Stitcher. So you can also find us there. Whatever is easier for you, whatever you prefer. We're just going to get ourselves out on a whole bunch of different platforms. It's just throw things against the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> It's pretty much uh, our philosophy these days. Um, this is a special episode. Today, we are going to finally do a dedicated episode to aerodynamics of Clearfield, Utah. And of course, I say that, but it, this actually encompasses it's arrow. There is arrow development, transition to arrow hus or hoos. If you want to kind of give it a German oomph, a little oomph band in there. Uh, I like saying Hus, though. And then, of course, Aerodynamics in the uh, last incarnation, and the one that I personally know the best. That's the one that spanned my own coaster riding years. Uh, so, this is it. I've called myself Mr. Arrow here before, and uh, I really do believe I am. Uh, and uh, just as, as just an Arrow fan, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but I'm definitely one of a few, of a few. There's not a lot, from what I can yeah. gather, uh, amongst enthusiasts and and even casual park goers and and lovers. There's just not a ton of love and respect for Arrow out there. No, there ain't. There's just not. And uh, so this is something I've wanted to do for a long time since we started doing. Thanks for writing. This has been on the back burner, but uh, something came up that finally pushed us to the forefront. A new documentary that has been released uh, very recently. It's 2016, I know. So it's yeah, I think February 2016. came out within the last few weeks uh, called The Legacy of Arrow. Yeah, done by Ace, American Coaster Enthusiast. Oh, get a piece of that ace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That Veronica Vaughn is some piece of ace. <laughs> wow, ace coming out of the woodwork. I forgot they were still around. Yeah, me too. So that's still a thing. I guess so. They still exist. I was even a member once for a year. <laughs> uh, but that was a while ago. And yeah, you don't hear about them much anymore. They've really faded. All right, good for them. I don't mind. Uh, honestly, I, I like Ace better than I like uh, most of the things that have replaced them uh, because mm. it just became an internet world. and So it's really just websites and podcasts, kind of like us, that kind of have taken <laughs> over uh, that role that Ace used to fill, which they were the primary organizers of events and a primary uh, meeting and discussion place for for enthusiasts across yeah, the country. For a long time, yeah. For the longest time, yeah. But I'm glad to see they're still going, and uh, I guess there's a few members somewhere. Uh, so good for them. They did a great job. Yeah, uh, they really did. They were right on point with Arrow, you might say. Oh. Bum -bum. <laughs> we should say right here that um, we're going to get into all the the nuts and bolts of this documentary get into all the specifics so uh, you should definitely watch it before you listen to the rest of this I think probably to get the full impact of the discussion of course you could also just get the facts from us as we talk about it <laughs> and not watch it uh, it's up to you uh, but I suggest you do yeah, the last thing I want to do is yeah. take any uh, viewership away from this documentary it's actually really magnanimous of them that they put this out immediately for free yeah. On YouTube. So as far as I can tell, they're not even trying to make a dime off this. This seems like it's truly a, a project, uh, a labor of love. Uh, it comes off entirely entirely like that. So, so, And it's not that long. It's like an hour ten. It's like perfect length for so, something yeah. like that. Yeah. All right. So Arrow development. 
is actually where it all begins. Didn't know much of anything about the very beginnings. Yeah, me neither. I, really, the, the entire documentary, I feel like, well, generally, I think you and I, because we're fans of Arrow, we might know more than some other enthusiasts, just because we're a fan of the company and their work. So we've looked into it more. But there was a lot of stuff in this documentary that I didn't know, especially those early years, like you said, because I knew they went back a long ways. I didn't know they actually went back to the 40s, though. Yeah, that was that was cool. Even just the, the old pictures they found. Yeah. To go along with that part at the beginning. Yeah, that was the majority of what I didn't know was the very earliest parts of the story. It even taught Mr. Arrow a few things. So, <laughs> you know, that just goes to show you how good it is. But yeah, uh, I did kind of know, though, that they didn't start out with the intention of doing roller coasters. That I did know. Yeah. So that, it's... it was like, I, I inferred that. It, it just makes sense. Because they, they only did steel coasters. I would have thought... Yeah, there was, there was never an Arrow Woody. Right. Uh, I, I would have thought that, uh, yeah, they didn't start out as a uh, coaster company if, if they're just going to do nothing but steel. Because steel didn't come along till 59, really, with them. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know... Having it be a major player in the amusement game. Right. There was a handful before that, but they were small, compact roller coasters, and they all featured flat rails. So the early days were, were interesting. Uh, I always knew the Morgans uh, were sort of part of Arrow. Yes. But right. I don't know that I ever knew exactly how it was, or if I did, like maybe I kind of forgot, and now I was kind of relearning it. But how, uh, so it was Morgan Sr. Ed Morgan. Edward Morgan who uh, was one of the founders of Arrow, along with, so was it Carl Bacon? It was like four Morgan, guys. All right. And like two other guys. And, and watch <laughs> it to find the rest. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Dick Arrow <laughs> and Dick Development. Yes. <laughs> and that's where they got Arrow Development from. Uh, <laughs> funny uh, how they got the name Arrow, that it was a total throwaway. It was a throwaway title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was what? It was like a, a tie pin. Yes. Apparently. Yeah. I, I, that's one of those things where you, where you have to wonder if it's true, just because it's so silly. I mean, <laughs> it's almost too silly to not be true, but I could also see that being a way that in in later years, any one of those four original uh, members might have just sort of romanticized how they came up with it. Whereas, I don't know if that really, you know, sometimes those kind of stories get warped over time. Yeah. You know, but it's it, it works. It's fine. Uh, but it has nothing to do with anything, really. No. <laughs> so it could have been called anything. It could have been called wash basin <laughs> development. Yeah. If you happen to look over and see a wash basin or necktie you know, development, whatever. Or it could have just been the tie itself. <laughs> yeah. Or it could have been, you know, whatever outhouse. <laughs> it's not outhouses, right? It was like what? 46 or something. Yeah. Um, it could have been any one of those things. It just happened to be uh, arrow. So that's, that's cool. I also, it was interesting to see about how the, uh, the kitty rides they did early on. Originally, they were in the kiddie ride business. And the, the one, it's I think it's at Santa Cruz yeah, Beach Santa Boardwalk. Cruz, is that yeah. where like, the oldest operating yeah, uh, so. piece of anything Arrow is still operates? And it looks, I mean, I don't know about the ones that I rode as a kid. I'm talking, well, we can get local, Nunley's of Baldwin, New York, or um, Adventureland, of course. Our very own Adventureland mm -hmm. that we've talked about many times in the show. But those, those both, ha both had, like, those motorboat kitty rides. I don't yeah. know if those were arrows. I really have no idea. It would take more research to find out. But they look a hell of a lot like that. So, who knows? Could have been. I could have rode my first arrow <laughs> at, like, three or whatever, uh, whatever I was when I rode those. Yeah. Got to go back. We got to we'll, we'll go back. to We'll go to Santa Cruz, and we'll get in the boat. And we'll, <laughs> and we'll sink it. Right. It'll just ride the bottom. <laughs> we're just scraping the bottom. Yeah. Imagine that sight. But, like, but we'll be thrilled. <laughs> we'll be just like the happiest two buffoons you've ever seen. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm riding an arrow. <laughs> okay, then, of course, the arrow story really heats up with Disney. Of course, Matterhorn bobsleds, first ever tubular steel track roller coaster. Um, a lot of people know that. I feel like yeah. that's, that's the one fact about Arrow. Or, you know, I feel like that's the one fact about roller coasters that people probably, even casual enthusiasts, must know. You should. If you don't, where have you been? Yeah, a lot of people know that. Um, you guys out there know that. I hope so. 1959, Matterhorn, that was the first time 
tubular steel rails uh, on a roller coaster. Revolutionary. Revolutionized all the steel roller coasters t to come. But I don't know if everybody knows that it's Arrow. Especially more so today. Because we're only getting further away from it. And I feel... I don't know. I think I think a lot of people in the enthusiast community uh, know, know that. The 13-year-old enthusiast today, does he know that? Um, I don't know. I think it's 50-50. Yeah, yeah I really don't know. Yeah. I think you got to know if you're getting into roller coasters, even at a young age, you, you're going to learn, you're going to find out about Matterhorn. But I don't know if you're going to know about Arrow. Mm. You might just take Matterhorn for what it is or assume Disney did it. You know, well, Disney and Wed did all the other ones until later years in the coma. But... Well, Matterhorn could be the last hour standing ever. Eventually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that, boy. That could, <laughs> that could be the only one Don't left. scare me like that. I'm going to say no. I think as long as Cedar Point is still thriving, I think not. But you never know. So, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it, everything had to fall into place. It's just an interesting series of events that led to the modernization of the amusement industry. It's kind of funny how... Disney played a part in that. They played a very integral role in getting Arrow to develop what was going to become the foundation of all roller coasters later, which really roller coasters that were going to be non-Disney, you know, everything that was going to be the anti-Disney part of the business that was yet to come at that point. But Disney kind of fueled it. So it's just yeah. all weird how that all kind of works out. So Matterhorn, um, I didn't realize though the extent of the role Arrow played in, in Disneyland and it, and the original opening. I didn't realize they had contracts for like like 10 other things. I didn't know that either. At that either. time. I mean, Matterhorn, not even, not even opening. That happened four years later. Right. But before that is when the Disney Arrow relationship started. And yeah, I didn't realize they had so much to do. with such a hand. Yeah, it was like, Disney. I, I think six attractions, uh, opening day attractions for Disneyland that yeah, they, uh, made, like, they helped develop. Oh, uh, they helped in all the original dark ride systems. Yeah, it was Alice in Wonderland, Casey Jr., uh, Dumbo, and then Dumbo, yeah, the flat rides, yeah, Dumbo and, and Mad Tea Party, right? Oh, uh, right, yeah, Mad Tea Party, yeah. Uh, they, they had Arrow had a hand in developing all of those attractions. Incredible, <laughs> yeah. Because I, I, and then I was wondering, did Arrow invent the hub and spoke system? Oh wow, um, no, I, I, I'm gonna say no way. No, okay, I, no I didn't way. think they could have. I mean, you, I know, but you know, but you definitely, I mean, you had flats before then. It wasn't yeah. like, you know, Disney knew he wanted to do the Dumbo right. version of it, but they definitely existed before that. But I think regardless, Dumbo is the one, is the hub and spoke ride that every single person knows. Oh. And that's the one it's the most that famous, gets copied. Most famous one ever. Yeah. He has the one that Arrow had a hand in. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Um, it's not the one that's there now. Well, yeah, yeah that, that ride has been. You know, well, I think that's the thing. I think in in every one of those cases, it's all essentially been rebuilt. Yeah, almost every one of those rides, I think, or maybe I think maybe it has been every one of those rides mm. has been rebuilt, except for Matterhorn. Yeah, right. The, the later thing they did, but all the opening day stuff, yeah, it's all rebuilt. But I mean, rebuilt in the image of the original, so you know, Arrow still had something to do with it overall. And then you know the the the, the big uh, bomb. And this I absolutely did not know was uh, that Walt Disney himself became a shareholder. Yeah, he owned a in, third of in, Arrow. In, in Arrow, yeah, that's unbelievable. I didn't know that either. I I, ne I never knew that. That was the one like head explode moment for, <laughs> for me. That was like my head exploded. Yeah, that, and then I didn't know that Arrow again in, in conjunction with Disney developed the boat system for Small World, and then eventually Pirates. I didn't know that either. Oh, that was Arrow. Yeah. Those are arrow flume systems. Yeah, that's yeah, pfft. it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Uh, it's mind blowing. Yeah, they had uh, a great relationship. If Walt Disney had lived another twenty years, as he should have been able to do, uh, who knows? Speaking from you know our perspective, uh, the way things worked out. I mean, who knows? I mean, that could be good or bad because it could have been. It could have meant that much more. You know, money pouring in to Arrow. But them still doing everything that they did do uh, in all the years after, after the 60s and after the Disney relationship uh, kind of waned. Or it could have just become a, th a thing where, you know, Disney would have just bought them and would have oh. absorbed, you know, it would have been like, uh, like with Pixar in the, in the movie division mm, where yeah. Pixar just became part of Disney after a while. 
it was a partnership for a bunch of years and then eventually was like, you know, we're just going to buy you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then if that would have happened and then, you know, Arrow development would have just been absorbed into Disney Imagineering and then we actually might not, not have gotten a lot of stuff that did happen. So it actually could have been, could have been worse because it's really all the non-Disney Arrow stuff that I, that I love. You know, I love, I love that it has this heritage. I mean, we're pretty anti-Disney on this show, as <laughs> most of you who listen to us uh, normally, you know, listen to us often must know. But um, I have no problem with Walt Disney himself or the original Disney, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is, the nine old men and the and wed, you know, that's great. I just think Disney, I, I don't like what Disney has become. It's, it's become a monster. Yeah. It's just like an evil corporation now. <laughs> and uh, I think it started in the 90s, really. And that's what I don't like. It doesn't taint it for me that Arrow had, was in bed with Disney early on. Because it was the good Disney. It was Disney that I respect <laughs> and like. Well, it, I always thought of Matterhorn as the exception in Arrow's history. But apparently it wasn't. You know, because they had this huge relationship with Disney. But apparently the the, the two... No, they were, were like, just so integrated. They were very linked, yeah. yeah. For, and, for until Disney's death, they, they were they were yeah. No, and that death was sixty six, sixty yeah, six. I think right? six, yeah. So you know, interesting when when you look at it in the in the timeline. What was the so the line train at over Texas was sixty four or five, sixty six. That was the same year. Yeah. But anyway, the point being that they were working on that even when the Disney relationship was still intact. Right. Disney was alive to see that. Uh, yes. Because he, he died in December, I believe, of 66. So not, not only that, but so so Arrow was still a very much an independent company. They worked a lot with Disney, but they were still working on other things at the same time. So maybe, you know, in uh, the late 60s, Disney, if he had lived, maybe he would have put in a mine train coaster. Before the Haxter Oh, did. imagine that, Tony <laughs> Haxter. <laughs> what a concept. What an idea. Maybe they would have put an Arrow Flume in. Maybe they would have done that too. At some point. Huh, imagine that. Yeah, because uh, Disney lived to see the first Log Flume too. And, and he kind of did it. <laughs> you know, Pirates was his going to be his version of it. His larger scale, high capacity version of it. The other thing that sticks out in my mind was the, uh, the, the uh, Autopia. I mean, I, I knew Arrow made anti-cars. I don't know that I ever really looked into it so far as to find out that they kind of pioneered them, <laughs> that they essentially created that, the most commonly seen version of the, of the anti-cars. Yeah, right. Um, with the center guide rail. That that was a, an Arrow innovation. That, that seems so simple. Yeah. Like anybody <laughs> should have or could have thought of that. <laughs> but, uh, but the people at Disney did not. Right. All those original, Bob Gurr and those guys... Uh, original Disney engineers, they didn't come up with that. They had a, just, the cars were kind of loose. They just had some kind of spring bumpers with wheels uh, system where you hit like the sides. If you hit, if you happen to hit a side, you know, they had kind of gu- guides on either side, um, kind of guide rails, but uh, that was a bad system. And uh, they ended up at going with the arrow system. Yeah. Uh, so even that, you know, it's, so it's, it's amazing. And there's a couple other of those early day facts, like uh, that they that the documentary actually doesn't go into enough, honestly. Uh, maybe it could maybe it should have been 90 minutes, and they should have added a few more things. Like there was a, a couple of different like testing grounds they talked about for their rides, kind of like we have Luna Park in Brooklyn today, where mm. Zamperla operates it and can use it to throw in any new ride concept uh, to then show off to the industry, or even just to kind of just do it for themselves to kind of maybe be a proof of concept that it, oh, this def- definitely works. Okay, people like it. Great. Uh, and Arrow had a couple of those in the early days. It was like a kiddie park they mentioned that was somewhere in California. I think they were both in California. I would assume, yeah, yeah. And then there was some other was like San Jose front- or frontier something. village or something. It was something yeah. like that uh, also. which And then it doesn't go into it much, and I haven't had a chance to look them up on my own yet, uh, but I definitely will at some point. Uh, I did know that they had their own, uh, that they would build like half or third pieces of rides in their own backyard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did, that I did know, and I had seen pictures of that in uh, the great coffee table picture books that I used to look at, at uh, in the 90s. 
uh, when those were more of a thing before the internet really blew up. But uh, they went into it in, in that much more detail than I knew. So that was great. Uh, even having some, some old footage, some actual like, mm-hmm, video yeah. footage of a couple of tests of some rides, the original corkscrew. And, yeah, that's uh, cool. And the original suspended coaster with a, a single, that a was single very car cool. testing just to see it. And then also an on-ride. They, they put a camera on the car yeah, to yeah. just see, I guess, before any humans were allowed to ride it, just to see what it looked like to kind of gauge it. Um, that, that was awesome. Yeah. So just unbelievable history right there. Roller coaster history. I mean, that's, that's it. And I want to bring up, I guess I'll just do it right now. This documentary is, is very arrow centric and as it should be. And you know what? I, I truly believe and I already believed it. And then this documentary just confirmed it that arrow is the foundation of the modern amusement industry. Oh yeah. I'm just gonna go Without ahead and say, it. I mean, yeah. I, they are, there would not be a modern amusement park industry the way we know it today if it wasn't for arrow yeah there it just wouldn't be and it's kind of funny that it, it, it makes sense that they uh partnered up with disney the because, other player because that, right that laid the foundation it's the, like the two the, of them together yeah right yeah. it's like disney had the vision for the overall modern park how that should how that should go how it should be laid out what types of attractions and the money More and the money he had the money sure. that company had the money and you know make a clean and just pristine and have excellent operations and customer service and all this kind of stuff. And then arrow with the ride side of it, developing these awesome ride systems that were reliable and that, uh, delivered on, uh, you know, they, they would satisfy the customer. So, uh, yeah, the two of them together, it's really, it's really amazing. Would someone else have come along and eventually thought of these things? I suppose, but it's, you know, it's tough to say for sure. Yeah, and it's impossible to know what form they would have taken. Right. Uh, but to finish the point that I was starting, this documentary doesn't really, aside from a couple uh, other roller coaster designer players that we'll get into at, uh, that led to Arrow's demise and kind of giving them a negative, putting them in a negative light for this documentary. Besides that, it, uh, kind of the villain role, so to speak. <laughs> we needed a villain role for this documentary. And those take that, you know, more or less. Mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, besides that, though, um, they don't go into anything else that was going on in the industry. So, like, when they did come up with the idea that, uh, or the fact that Arrow did work on a bobsled roller coaster concept, which was supposed to be bringing the old wooden trough flying turns into the modern era, which was, I guess, whatever, the 70s maybe early 80s, whatever. They didn't give us a date. So because of that, I don't know if it predates when Intamin would have worked on their bobsled and eventually got it open and it became a successful or mildly successful ride type, you know, successful enough that there was a bunch sold. Or not. Or, you know, did, was Arrow reacting to Intamin doing it? And we're like, oh, we should do one of these? or were, And then you couldn't even figure it out? Or were they doing it first? And the documentary, documentary does not confirm that. So... I love Arrow, but I can also be fair. I don't know. I like to think that they they also kind of were the first to have that idea and then Intamin picked up on it. But then again, how could they have? No, if you look at the history of Arrow, uh, they definitely innovated. They, they weren't like... They were innovators. They weren't like B&M. B&M doesn't innovate stuff. They take other people's ideas and they improve upon them. Arrow... They're perfectionists. Yes. They perfect ideas. But Arrow tended to be the one that came up with the idea first. Again, with this bobsled coaster idea, I don't, you know, we don't know, so but... We uh, don't know for sure, but it does sort of fit the profile of Arrow that they would have thought of at first. Right. That they would have... I mean, they didn't think of it first because it was a flying turn. Well, right, but... But that they, at least, uh, we're talking about from a modern, you know, they were the first to, to bring everything into the modern era. Yeah, that was their style. You know, modern engineering. We're going to modern engineering, and again, modern, it's not modern any longer, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> talking today at 2016, uh, but modern at the time, again, 70s and 80s, bringing it to those standards. And they did that time and time again. Uh, so that was one example where I just realized how they didn't really go into other things that were going on in the industry or other players. They didn't even mention Intamin. It was an arrow. Uh, oh, arrow. An arrow. <laughs> it was an hour and 10 minutes of arrow in the spotlight. Yeah. And it should have been. Which, so right, was, which arrow was, doesn't get. It was perfect. Ever. I don't, I don't even know when they were still around if it ever got it. I don't think they did. All I ever hear is the, the snide comments and the, 
you know, making fun. Oh, I'd say, you know. It's rough as hell. Every, yeah, it's always. Every arrow is just really rough. God, it's just, I, I, they are kind of rough, but it's a it's good. It's it's weird, right? It you could not appreciate all the rides. All right, it, maybe if for some people it is too rough, I'll accept that. But you gotta respect what they have done for the industry. Either way, right? Yeah, and there's not enough of that going on. But I also have a problem with the idea of it being too rough because, save for a, a, a few it rides that maybe were, were worse than the others. Overall, it's just, you gotta know how to ride it. <laughs> and I don't mind that. You know, just the ride being uh, a flying chair, a flying easy chair that you don't have to move, it, it can be kind of boring. It's like a badge of honor that when you ride it so many times, it gets to a point that you can do it without banging your head. Hmm. Because it was, it was possible. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, between the two of us, we must have a combined, what, 100 rides on Drakenfire? Maybe more? Possibly, yeah. <laughs> and it's... You got to a point where you you learned how to move with it. It was there. The great ride was in there. You just had to find it. <laughs> with the air rides, I chalk it up to the ride having some personality. Having some character. Most of their rides are... Most of their coasters are sort of just rough enough. It's like the perfect amount to, to, to give it some character. Ah, it's a little something, a little, little action. Yeah. Now, I mean, we're both huge fans of B&M, and those rides are very smooth, but they're really forceful. They're really powerful. Arrow didn't really have, with the exception maybe the Mega Loopers, their rides didn't necessarily have that. They had character instead of pulling, you know, the huge Gs like a B&M ride does or something. I think they, they pulled their share of Gs too, but uh, I know what you're saying, though. It, it's just, it's different. It, it was a the arrow feel for, for, for whatever whatever that is that just enough uh guesswork in there <laughs> it's great that it's, it gave it a unique feel you knew you were, you were riding an arrow oh it's it's just it's indescribable in some ways yeah it's just yeah. it's great yeah it kind of is it's just arrow and it's awesome uh i still can't get enough of it i love it uh the fact that it's becoming more rare it makes me appreciate it even more oh definitely you know, as if i yeah. i i, I won't a bunch of years ago, I wouldn't have thought that was possible, but uh, it's like I, I, I appreciate it even more now. Um, well, it's like with Arrow Suspended coasters. Now that the wolf is gone, you know, whenever we can get on an Arrow Suspended, it's great to have that sensation again. Yeah. Because it's so rare to get it these days. Yeah. Um, all right. I mean, back into the story. So, you know, eventually the Disney relationship ended. Um, they did a ton of innovation. The one, though, that the only other one we've already mentioned a couple of them like suspended and the, the aborted bobsled attempt the, the notable one though otherwise is the corkscrew so we should yeah. just mention that the fact that arrow essentially invented that element it's one of the most iconic elements and images in, in all of roller coasters and they did it the documentary would have you believe that they invented the looping coaster which is well, the modern, well, not, not they acknowledge totally accurate. they acknowledge history. They acknowledge the turn of the century. Yeah, you know, loop the loops and stuff. But they but, do gloss over yeah. something kind of important. They gloss over revolution at Six Flags Magic Mountain. Not, was, not, not even gloss over. They they ignore it. They, they it's right completely omitted. Yeah, they don't even mention Schwarzkopf at all. And yeah, so the fact that Schwarzkopf actually brought the vertical loop uh, into the modern era and did that kind of before slash same time more or less as Arrow was developing their course crew. So that was sort of one case where Arrow might have been a little more conservative uh, after the failure of the original loops, the original perfect circle loops that they did in, in Coney Island and a few other places uh, in the early 1900s. They actually thought that the loop as a concept was not even worth trying. And they weren't willing to even do an inversion until they thought of the idea of elongating the loop and making it into this course crew element, mm. kind of basing it on um, aerobatic planes, uh, an aerobatic maneuver that a, a, an airplane can do. And meanwhile, at the same time, if not even a year or so before, Schwarzkopf just said, oh, I can make a loop <laughs> and did it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they don't mention that in the documentary. That one, I think they should have at least mentioned. They definitely should have. Because then they just go right into... So, you know, the course crew was a success. They talked about the first ever one in Knott's Berry Farm. 
and then they just go right into and then that led to you know Arrow doing the loop and then like they go right into like shuttle loop yeah and it's like okay but they did that because Schwarzkopf successfully did a loop first <laughs> <laughs> and then they realized oh we could do loops too and then they did their very distinct uh, the teardrop loop which yeah. is more them although I, I'm pretty sure I mean I don't think Schwarzkopf are perfectly spherical I mean they're not they circular be. no he did he did realize that if you squish it in a little bit make it a little elliptical that it will work but Arrow went even more extreme with it Th that is the one point in the documentary where maybe they gave Arrow a little extra credit that they didn't deserve <laughs> uh, which is which it doesn't even need because there's so much that they honestly did do that they didn't need that one extra little let's make it look like they also made the first modern loop so maybe that's almost why we both feel they should have mentioned Schwarzkopf because it's like you could do that and you still wouldn't have taken away from the legacy of Arrow one bit because they did so many things that how could you even fault them for that? Like, right. Okay, so they did the loop second. It still doesn't take anything away. It's cool to know it, it's the, it's actually how the documentary ends but that the original course crew is still operational. Yeah, that's very cool. I didn't know that. What is it, Lagoon? Silverwood in Idaho. <sighs> Man, I mean, we can go on about, about this forever, couldn't we? Oh, I know I could. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the log flume, the first log flume. They worked a lot with the Over Texas. That in many ways. I mean, Over Texas yeah. was the first regional park, and Arrow had everything to do with their success. Definitely. Uh, all yeah. their major early hits were all Arrows. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that I just, I, I really feel like I have to bring up is uh, in this documentary, they were stating it as fact, because I, I had heard the story about. Dragonfire that... Oh, uh, Drakenfire. Drakenfire. Please. Right. Uh, that originally Bush Gardens wanted B&M to do it, but they pulled out for whatever reason, and then Arrow stepped in to complete the project. That's why that layout is so weird and kind of really un-Arrow-like. So, you know, I thought that was like a rumor. I didn't... Or like a myth. I didn't know if there was really any truth to it, but this documentary is stating it as fact. It's a it's a pivotal roller coaster. It's a milestone roller coaster, not in a positive way though. Unfortunately, mm. uh, as much as 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 many positive feelings as it brings out in me, and, and I'm sure you too. But oh, I that's absolutely us. love that ride. And we're I mean we're already a minority that we love Arrow so much, but where we're even more of a minority in the fact that we respect Dragonfire so much. Oh, that was a fantastic ride. Because yeah, I think almost no one else does. That was an ass kicker. It's honorary Hall of Fame number one status for me. All, I mean, I, I can't ever... It, it can never be knocked off. I mean, again, in all fairness, because I can never re up on it, it's just I have to give it the caveat. It, it, it's the asterisk. It, it's honorary. You know, I was also just happened to be the right age in that small window when, when it existed. Uh, if I had been younger, I probably would never have ridden it. And if I had been older, I don't know. It's impossible for me to say how I would have reacted to it, but I was, it was just the right place, the right time. God, that was such an awesome ride. <laughs> that's yeah. the one I don't even think about it. I mean, if there's one ride I could ride again that doesn't exist any longer, that's the one. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you on that. I yeah. mean, even with the Wolf, Wolf might be a close second. Uh, so I'm glad I got a, a feature part of this documentary. I had never seen it put, the whole Truck and Fire story put in the way that it was put in this documentary. And it, it was kind of profound. It was, it was, you know, you, even when you research it online, it's, it's usually going to be in writing and it's, it's, they talk about it. It was rough and they found cracks and this, and you, you'll see these different things and then, you know, but it just, here it just made so much sense because they, they, they had already introduced B&M before this in the documentary and the fact that B&M had perfected the tubular steel track with the spine and their rides were you know, smooth beyond belief. It was a whole new, you know, level of of design. So Arrow already kind of knew they the pressure was on. They knew they had to start stepping outside their comfort zone to try to keep up. And then they got the chance to 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 do a ride or design a ride that was going to be based on early designs that were done by P and M first. So they pushed it, and um, unfortunately, there track style and their trains you know couldn't keep up and just to yeah it's just, just to have it put that way and have it laid out like that like that, that that's really what it was 
And it's like, wow, that's that's perfect. Yeah. What a great way to sum it all up. You don't have to get into every little thing or even have to reference the fact that Arrow is r- are rough to begin with and then right. like this was the the roughest of the rough. But like no, it's just it was just they were what they were, but they were starting to become obsolete. You know, I mean in my opinion it did work. It was a viable ride. Mm-hmm. I think if it had been in any any other park, it would have lasted a lot longer. I don't know if it'd be around today. Um, yeah, I, but I, I think agree. it could have lasted a a bunch of more years than it did. Yeah, it was not around for very long at all. Um, we got to mention Ron Toomer. Oh yeah, Ronnie Toomer. Yeah. It's, it's a crime. We've been doing this for like whatever forty minutes already, or an hour, <laughs> and uh, we haven't even mentioned Ron Toomer yet, and how integral he was. He came in in, I guess, the 60s? Yeah, 60s. He was hired on, interestingly enough, the first ever um, like licensed engineer that they ever hired. Like the first 20 years yeah, of the company. Yeah, that's really interesting. Where it was 18, 20 years, <laughs> they went with just, it was all guesswork. <laughs> it was just all idea, a bunch of idea guys, pretty much. Uh, but none of them um, had like engineering degrees. And uh, Tumor was the first one that actually had that. <laughs> so I guess they figured after a while, like, if we're going to keep doing this and be successful, like, I guess we got to get someone who's fully certified on our staff. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, Ron Tumor is responsible for almost all of the iconic Arrow roller coasters. It's funny. The pictures they showed, there was, like, no young pictures of him. It was just him, <laughs> like, in the, like, late 90s, like, about right about the time he gave it up. <laughs> Maybe it was mid '90s, but mm. like the pictures are all him with the big glasses and like looking kind of old, <laughs> with the white hair already. Well, it's like I don't know if he actually wrote any of his own creations, right? You were like one or something, because he didn't actually he, really care for it, right? He, uh, I think you have to think about him. Yeah, he wasn't. I, I want to say he said in interviews that he did later on that he wrote everyone once. Oh, or okay. something like that. Like he would write everyone once. <laughs> he had to go through it once just to see. It was kind of like a proof of concept thing, you know, classic, you know being an engineer yeah and having yeah. A, a mind uh, that works that way you, you gotta just know for yourself so you know what a guy i mean we, we could do another episode just on him really if you wanted to <laughs> yeah just, just as much as they could do another documentary just on him so fucking vacoma right <laughs> we gotta talk about this for at least a minute yeah, Vacoma, they're kind of the bad guys in this documentary which is pretty funny yeah i mentioned that yeah it was vacoma and then and B and M again, kind of the villain roles, but Vacoma more. So yeah. So Vacoma was kind of like the mustache trolling villain uh, in this. It's it, and it's one of those things. I mean, you gotta take the good with the bad. Uh, talking about what we started earlier with the Disney interaction with with Arrow. You know, I mean, who knows? Arrow may never have gotten off the ground or uh, in the first place if it wasn't for the Disney interaction. So you know, that led to whatever it led to. But in, ultimately, what happened was, and this I wasn't totally aware of, although as soon as I saw it, it made perfect sense to me, but the fact that Arrow imparted their knowledge to Vekoma. As soon as I heard that, it made perfect sense, because it's like, well, well, their track is essentially the same, yeah. and their trains are essentially the same, so it kind of makes sense. Uh, what it was, was at the time, Arrow was looking to break into the European market, so they figured they would uh, team up with a European manufacturer, uh, that they would train and get up to speed on the processes uh, that Arrow utilized to manufacture their rides, to actually manufacture the steel. With the deal being that they were they would still be the designers, and then Vacoma would be the builders. This way, Arrow didn't have to ship their track pieces overseas. Uh, makes sense. Yeah. They were also going to build the trains, too. Arrow was going to continue to make their own trains, and those they'd ship over, I guess. But that'd be the only, the only part. However, I guess they didn't have a written deal in place when they did this. Apparently, they were just uh, gentlemen's agreement, you know, you know, handshake, pat on the back kind of thing, which was stupid. <laughs> and yeah. uh, they got fucked over big time. Akoma ended up taking all the knowledge and then saying, all right, now we're going to go into the business ourselves. And that was it. And they just started making their, their own rides. And never looked back. <laughs> they made their own trains, and they got their own designers, and that was it. They never honored the deal. So Arrow never fully broke into the European market like they were supposed to, uh, which which makes sense, too, because that explains why there's only a handful uh, in Europe. Never was nearly as many as there were over here. Hmm. And 
at the same time, you know, Vacoma became huge, really uh, on one design, the boomerang. Uh, and it's still going strong, all those fucking it's, boomerangs. And it's still going strong. Believe it or not, still hasn't been a closure of one voluntarily by a park. Only a couple of cases where the whole park closed, but uh, we've never seen a, a boomerang just voluntarily closed and demolished at any one park. That's incredible. At least in this country, which I'm, I'm not as up on around the world, but at least within this own with this country, uh, the U.S., we have not seen that yet. So it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, like what a third to a half of Arrow's catalog has been dismantled and oh yeah closed voluntarily by parks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like wow. Yeah, and, and they say the line. They say essentially Arrow creates its own competition. They created their yeah. own monster, and it's like. God damn it! Why did they do that? I, I appreciate that they're they were the good guys in every sense. You know, they're even so nice as to to want to believe <laughs> that they could do business that way. But uh, it was so stupid. Unfortunately, it was so <laughs> yeah. From a business standpoint, it was so stupid to do that to not have lawyers and have contracts written first before you went in and gave all your knowledge. And trained them on, and they gave them documents, I'm sure, and uh, and formulas to use and stuff. And why would you do that without having it written in stone that they couldn't stab you in the back with it? And that's exactly what they did. You know that it it, it makes sense. That's why the coma track looks like that. And uh, and not just that, but um, I knew Morgan had a connection to Arrow, so I didn't have to wonder so much why Morgan's track uh, also looks like Arrow track. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's interesting. There are a couple of other companies uh, that ended up essentially using the same track design. Right. Yeah. Morgan was because of Ed Morgan's son, Dana. Dana Morgan, right. Worked for Arrow. Uh, was like born into the company and worked there for right. worked almost for, his whole life. For many years. And then, then just at a certain point felt he had to get out on his own and yeah. well, do his own thing. Yeah. Right. Which is, which is fair enough. And then, yeah. And he, and he went off and did, did Morgan. Morgan Manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So even, yeah, even within, not only just within the ideas and the types of rides and roller coasters that Arrow started, did they have so much influence on the industry, but also specific other companies <laughs> that wouldn't have had a chance to get off the ground if it wasn't for Arrow. You wouldn't have had Morgan. Uh, they didn't ended up not doing too much, actually. Yeah. But you wouldn't have had it. Um, you wouldn't have had Vacoma, apparently. You wouldn't have had the Boomerang <laughs> and the SLC. For better or worse, yeah, you would never have had that. Uh, and then, and then, and then, how odd is that? That Vacoma comes back around and, be and becomes uh, Disney's uh, manufacturer of choice. <laughs> yeah, uh, in yeah. the late nineties. That's and, really weird. And does a bunch of work for them. So you know, the documentary is called Legacy of Arrow. It's kind of funny, but um, they don't they don't touch on and, and I guess you know they don't they don't really need to, but they don't touch on the legacy of Arrow in most people's minds, which is. It was a shit company that made shit rides. Okay, wow. <laughs> you think it goes that far? In in most people's minds, yeah. I think so. I can see it. I've heard it. I've read it. I've read things that sort of suggest that. So yeah, okay. But uh, it's you know it's funny though that even still today, if you see an ad with a roller coaster in it, or some sort of promotional material with a roller coaster in it, a lot of times it's an arrow or it's arrow style track and train almost always yes. yeah still today still that's to the day. classic image yeah that people have when they think of a roller coaster i think if, you, if you're thinking of a steel roller coaster i i do think a lot of people maybe most people actually think of an arrow style coaster yeah for one reason or another yeah i mean i gotta believe bm sort of takes over that role but eventually at least in in yeah when you see like print ads and they have to do a picture of a roller coaster yeah it is almost always arrow track <laughs> hey you could, you'll see a lot of arrow track on uh, our website <laughs> that's right <laughs> but that's purposeful so now we're not just like a you know we're doing a car ad that has a roller coaster in the background for whatever reason to promote like it's like a summer promotion or something and then you know it's just arrow track we do it purposely one other last interesting thing was the fact that it, they mentioned that arrow built affordable rides yeah i never would have thought about about them that way uh because in their prime they were it 
you know, they were the it company. They were the company that everyone wanted a ride from. They say that in the documentary, you know, you, your park wasn't complete until you had an arrow ride. At least one, if not a few of the different things, you know, the anti cars plus the flume plus a roller coaster, either mine train or a course crew when that started coming out. But apparently they were affordably priced. Yeah, they even mentioned that when B&M came along, B&M was twice oh, as expensive. Yes. As Arrow. It was like twice as much per foot than Arrow. Yeah. And, and the way they mentioned it was that people still went with B&M. <laughs> right. They paid that extra cost because it was like, we got to get this. Right. Which is... It was worth the price. So Arrow was affordably priced and constantly hurt for money. Yeah. You know, maybe <laughs> maybe they actually undercut themselves. They don't say it directly, but it's sort of implied that maybe they could have could have charged more than they did. Yeah. It, well, se- it seems like the fact that they, they didn't have uh, a very good business acumen is sort of a common thread yes, throughout right. the entire history of Arrow. Any of the incarnations it took, and it's like they were always more about being the idea guys, being right. the innovators, and they were always so excited when they got something that it worked and they could get it out to market. They never really thought about capitalizing on it or how much money do we have to charge so that we can pay our bills. It seems like they were always on the edge of bankruptcy almost the entire time. Right. They loved what they did. They loved designing these rides and and, and seeing those designs come to fruition. But yeah, it's funny, even going back to when they designed those, I think it was six rides for uh disneyland when it first opened in 55 yeah, they, every single one of those rides they lost money on yeah <laughs> even from the very beginning they just they didn't have good business sense they absolutely did not and it, it took walt disney himself to bail them out right at the time i know for myself i might rather have the influence than the success yeah i wouldn't uh you know it's treat like, anything they did would for- you rather just be a billionaire for billionaire's sake, or yeah. would you rather actually have make a mark right, on right. some industry in in this world? And you know, you could tell that yeah, the, from the original founders uh, to Ron Toomer and uh, the guys who came on later, like uh, Shilke, mm-hmm. what's his first name? Alan. Alan Shilke. They were all similar in that they were all about the product and 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 the innovation, and they all love what they did. And I think, and maybe that's the one thing that the documentary doesn't state at the end, but I think that's the real legacy of Arrow. It's just that it was, it just seemed like it would have been so great to work for that company uh, because they just love what they did. And it really came through. And they weren't in it to make money. They were not. <laughs> no, apparently they not. They clearly were not. <laughs> they, they were in it because they wanted to be in it. And they constantly wanted to find that next new concept that people were just going to love. That thrill seekers were just going to love it. And that's what they wanted. And it's just great. I mean, how can you not like that? Yeah. And, and I mean, when, rough or not, how can you not love that? Right. And when almost all these concepts debuted, people did love it. You know, the Mega Looper, the Suspended Coaster, all these things, you know, they were hits. Yeah. They had the failures that just never got built. But, that, you know, uh, uh, Hyper Coaster. Oh, yeah. What about that? When Magnum. That, yeah, that, they, they, they started that. They really, the documentary does take some time out to really focus on that ride yeah that gets a big feature and that's a positive one on um, yes. the fire is sort of the negative one that comes a little yeah. later but yeah how that starts the coaster wars it starts the idea of the hyper airtime machine as a as a thing you know i mean i heard gemini first even yeah which really kind of started the steel tubular roller coaster without inversions uh but not a mine train something more uh and then the real end of the story is is x and that was after Ron Toomer had already had left. Uh, you know, he was the president. You know, he kind of took over the company at, toward, at the end. Well, which, when, they, uh, when they became Aerodynamics. Yeah, when they became Aerodynamics. That was an interesting story, too. I didn't know all the facts, I guess. Uh, I didn't know that it was uh, something that they wanted to do, but as a smaller ride. And yeah. that, you know, that's another one of those, you know, it's like fucking Vacoma. It's like a fucking Six Flags, you know, and I already, <laughs> already kind of hate Six Flags anyway. Um, or uh, they annoy me a lot, at least. And, um, you know, it's like they had to push them to do the 200 foot one. Because, like, if they didn't do that, who knows? Maybe it wouldn't have destroyed them. But, again, it's if Six Flags didn't exist, would they have ever had the chance to build X? In the first place, you know, who knows? Right. Well, maybe not. Maybe no one would have wanted a ride like that at all. Six Flags and Magic Mountain specifically wanted it, but they wanted it to be huge. And that's what pushed Arrow to the limits. And eventually, 
destroyed them. Uh, although that is still a crazy ride that I am... I am glad it exists. Yes, yeah. Because it is so insane. But yeah, it is like the ride that never should have existed. <laughs> in a weird way. It should only be a computer animation that was like never completed. It's just insane. <laughs> but you know what's cool is... um pieces of Arrow do live on. I'm not, not talking about the rides themselves, but, you know, when Arrow went under, SNS bought up all their assets, so they use some of that technology still today. That they and do. supply parts. And even, yeah, like Alan Schilke, who is a, a designer for Arrow towards the end of Arrow's run, but he's with Rocky Mountain now doing his crazy thing. Yeah, Rocky Mountain. Yeah, again, even in the, the more recent history, you know, Arrow has a part like right so people so, who came up in arrow you know that's where you get rocky mountain now yeah so so arrows talking about the legacy of arrow you know the They're, legacy does live on you know not oh, just absolutely. in the rides but in some people and in some other companies actually and that's really cool that's awesome and it's i guess it's the best we can get unfortunately yeah I mean, if arrow is gone and it's not coming yeah. back it's been a long time already so that's the best we can get. Ah, you know, Arrow. I just, I hope the ones that are still there can continue on for at least the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Vortex, you can't see, but I'm wearing the shirt right now as we, <laughs> as we recorded this. The King's Island Vortex, yeah. King's Island's Vortex. I guess, I guess right, I gotta specify that. In my opinion, the greatest still standing Arrow It'll take at least 50 more years before the true legacy of Arrow could be washed out. Yeah, it'll you know, be a while. They're ingrained for at least that much longer. I hope it's it's even longer. I hope it's in perpetuity. I hope enough of these things will be kept by the parks. Do what you got to do. If, if a track section is getting fatigued, you know, you could probably get someone. You could get, God forbid, Vacoma or someone to manufacture it for you. Or call up SNS. You know, or they yeah. should have the plans. You think? I hope so. I mean, uh, the, the influence and the history that they had will never change, but it will, it's to be seen how much further it goes. But it's going to take a while before it all comes out in the wash. I mean, there's always going to be a number of arrow rides for a while. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to enjoy every goddamn one of them to the end of my roller coaster riding days. I know that much. Yeah, me too. So for our development, Arrow Huss, our dynamics, here's to you. <laughs>